<clears throat> by the way, I don't know how many of you noticed uh, there's been a, a slight upgrade to our sound system. Let me just, how many of you did notice that? How many did not notice and you are surprised? I just, yeah, okay, <laughs> well, you know. Uh, the, you should know the purpose of the uh, upgrade in sound is not to get louder. The purpose in upgrading sound is to get clearer. And so this room presents, if you, if you know such things about acoustics, this room presents an, uh, some unique challenges. And uh, we have some long range plans for the equipment that we were using. And so this is all part of our long range plan. And we were actually able to complete that this year rather than waiting into next year. So, or complete that last year rather than waiting until this year. So you are the first. Uh, if it's not perfect, we're still working on it. But uh, our goal is to always make, when you gather here, the clearest and most compelling time that we can possibly present for you. And so that's why uh, we've made those upgrades. Uh, we are in Genesis, the first chapter. If you're not familiar with the Bible, it's like page one and uh, easy to find. And this morning, we're starting a series called Honest to God. We're going to spend most of the month of January doing a deep dive into the concept of prayer. And I think a lot of us feel fairly inadequate or awkward when it comes to praying. And we're not sure that we're getting it right or if we're, if, if we're effective in it. And so this morning, I'd like us to look at a very surprising concept about prayer. In fact, it might be the first time you've ever thought about this regarding prayer. And we're going to start in Genesis, the third chapter. Uh, so that's like three pages in. And it says in uh, the eighth verse, Then the man and his wife, it's talking about Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they, what did they do? They, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, would you please say the next words? Where are you? The Lord God calls to him and asks, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So how do you think about prayer? Uh, some people just see it as an option, uh, something you do or you don't do. You, you pray or you pass, and it's not really significant one way or the other. There are other people who see it as an obligation, they actually think that something bad might happen if you don't pray, or even worse, God might punish you if you don't pray. If you could have seen a conversation, let me ask you this question. If you could have a conversation with any living person in the world today, who would you want to talk to? A conversation with any person in the world today, who would you want to talk to? Just think about that for a second, and then I'd, I'd like you to actually write their name down on your on your bulletin. If you don't want the person next to you to know who it is, you can write it in code, or if you have handwriting like mine, they'll never figure it out. And um, so who would you like to talk to? And just think about, if you know who you want to talk to, just think about what would you want to talk to them about? What would you want to know from them? What would you want to learn from them? Um, I don't think any of us would use that single opportunity to get a person just to give them a piece of our mind. I've been waiting for years to tell them what I think. I think we would probably exercise uh, a different option. Uh, if you went into that conversation, obviously there would be some polite greetings. And then inevitably you're going to do something. You're going to ask a question. The truth is, this is how we learn. We ask questions. And it's also how we receive. We ask questions. The Bible tells us something surprising in James, the fourth chapter. It says, the reason we do not have is because we do not ask. Some of us are not good askers. So how can we learn if we don't ask questions? How can we receive if we don't ask questions? So you might start the conversation with a question, but we might be surprised if they actually turned around and asked some questions to us. 
For example, they might want to know what you wish to gain from their conversation. They might ask questions that help you focus on what's the most important thing with the time that you have for them for that few minutes. They may ask some questions to help you gain some new insight or some perspective on some challenge that you are facing. And that's when we realize that prayer can actually be an opportunity. There's a missing slide there, so it's an opportunity. Prayer is an opportunity. What if prayer is an opportunity for a conversation with the most loving, most powerful, and wisest being in the entire universe? What if prayer is not about some kind of religious obligation at all? What if prayer is all about some kind of relationship? How would that change the way you think about prayer? Have you ever had someone come up to you and they just start telling you what you need to know and what you need to do? We take that a lot better when we're little, but the bigger and the older we get, we take that a lot less well, and we start feeling like we're being treated like a child. And so this is what's true, is that we do not feel significant when somebody just gives us statements. There's something that happens when somebody asks us questions. I was surprised to discover that Jesus in the four Gospels actually asked 183 questions. And by the way, he only directly answered three of the questions that he asked. Why would he do that? Because God asks questions. So here's, I just want you to think about this throughout the morning. What's the last question God asked you? And if you don't know the answer to that, maybe we're leaving something out of our prayer time that could be the most significant thing to us. All through Scripture, God asks questions. Here's some example of questions that God asks. We read the first one today, where are you? How about this one? Where is your brother? Remember he asked Cain about that. What is in your hand? What is your name? What are you doing here? Those are questions God asks in the Old Testament. Here's some examples of questions that Jesus asked in the New Testament. What are you looking for? Who do you say that I am? Do you want to get well? Why are you crying? Do you understand what I have done for you? Surprisingly enough, God actually values what we think and what we feel. There may not be a lot of other people who do that, but God does. And that's why this is such an important concept. You are far more likely to experience transformation and maturity through questions than you are through statements. It's not how our culture is built. It's not what we're trained to believe. But when you look at the example of God, when you look at the example of his son Jesus, you discover that they ask a lot of questions. In fact, in this story, after Adam and Eve fall, God asks four questions before he makes a single statement. He asks four questions before he makes a single statement. So, what questions has God been asking you lately? And how were you able to respond to that? See, our tendency when we go into prayer time is not to wait to see if God has questions of us. We have questions for him. And there's things that we want him to do. Does anybody else besides me assign God a to-do list? I do that. It's my prayer request list. And here's what I'd like you to do for this person. And here's what I'd like you to do for this person. And we want to be very efficient. And we want to be very effective. And so we blow in with all of our concerns and all of our questions and all of our to-dos. And then we close it with, in Jesus' name, amen. And we're out the door. And we might assume that because God knows everything, he doesn't have to ask anything. And this is the most amazing discovery. God's questions are not for him. They are for you. When God asks a question, he's not trying to find out information. He's trying to help you discover information. I mean, when you think about it, he asks Adam and Eve, where are you? Do you really think God did not know where they were? Do you think God is wandering through the garden and go, I know they were here just a minute ago. I just saw them yesterday. Where are they? I, 
I think that God knew exactly what tree they were hiding behind. I think God knew exactly what they had done to make themselves this afraid. I think that God knew all about their new fashion line of fig leaves they had sewn together. I think God knew everything about it, and yet God asked the question, where are you? He didn't sneak up behind them. He could have told them, accused them in vivid detail about every action that they had committed and every word that they had spoken in his absence, and he didn't do it. He asked questions. So why did he do that? Here's two important truths to remember today. When you hear God's questions, you discover his love for you. When you hear God's questions, you discover his love for you. This, this is, uh, have you ever seen a movie? I won't ask you if this has ever happened to you because I don't think it has. But uh, have you ever seen a movie where the police are after some bad guy? And uh, they're, they're doing a manhunt. And sometimes they'll even do, use dogs. And uh, I think I've told you, I've, I've got, I've got uh, three fears in my life. Fear of heights, I don't like falling. Fear of fire, being burned. And fear of dogs, I don't like being bit. I've been bit many times. I've been significantly burned once. And uh, I, don't, I don't like anything. I actually had a dream one night. All three things occurred to me. I know. <laughs> pleasant, and thankfully that has not happened again. And uh, can you imagine just dogs running you down? God did not send dogs or creatures to hunt down criminals who had committed some act that violated his will. They're not criminals that are on the lamb. They are lost children that don't know where they are. And you can see the heart of God by how he walks into the garden and he calls out to them. Because the heart of God is constantly searching for every single person in our world. Constantly searching. There is no one God is not searching for. There are some people you would like to avoid, but not God. You probably had to get together with some of those people over the holiday season. Rumor has it that's why they invented eggnog. And so you could tolerate certain people in the room for a short period of time. But this is, this is what's true, is that God doesn't think about any of us that way. God constantly seeks us. He constantly searches for us. He's constantly looking for us. He's constantly calling to us. Where are you? When you hear the questions of God, you discover the love of God. This is so important to Jesus that he actually told three stories in a row to drive this home. It was the story of the lost sheep and the story of the lost coin and the story of the lost boy. And he drives the point home. God is always searching and looking for you. He's always calling out to you, where are you? And when does the search end? When does the search end? He doesn't end when it gets dark, and he doesn't end when he gets tired. He ends his search when he finds us. Aren't you glad God keeps looking no matter what? That's what we hear. Where are you? That's what that is revealing. The question of God reveals how much he loves us. God desires a friendship with you. So where are you? Well, you might say, well, I'm in church. Well, actually, not all of you are actually here right now. Uh, some of you who are in the room, your mind has actually wandered someplace else. You're remembering something about the holiday season, something that you enjoyed and would like to relive, or something that was good and you would like to extend, or something you'd like to erase from the season altogether. And then some of you might be thinking about responsibilities that you've got to take care of after the big holiday weekend. What do you have to do this upcoming week? Please understand this. God will ask you where you are not to scold you for not being attentive enough. He asks you to, where you are to identify what's weighing in on your heart and mind. Where are you right now? When you have a few minutes of silence, where does your mind wander? 
See, some of us are hiding in this room. We're not just hiding from God. We actually hide from ourselves. We hide from each other. Some of you are in camouflage today. You are here, but we're not seeing the real you. You are afraid. If someone sees the real you, you will not be accepted. You will be rejected. Hiding is the antithesis of intimacy. In real intimacy, there is no hiding. And we are good at hiding all kinds of things. We hide our grief. We hide our anger. We hide our disinterest. How many of you, don't raise your hand, just consider this a rhetorical question. How many of you have ever acted interested when you were not? We hide our fear. You see, fig leaves come in all shapes and sizes. And the questions of God, they reveal the heart of God, the love of God to us, because we're hiding. But the second thing, the questions of God, when you answer God's questions, you discover the grace of God. When you answer the questions of God, you discover the grace of God. This is absolutely astonishing. He comes to draw us out of hiding. He comes to accept us. This is astonishing because we're sure that he's going to reject us. We're not good enough. We don't measure up. We're too flawed. We make too many mistakes. We've got too many misdeeds assigned to our lives. And so we're assured that we don't measure up. And God comes and he accepts us. He cannot be a just God and not have a price to pay for our mistakes and misdeeds. And so he, this God of ours sends his one and only son to pay the price for us. And that would be good enough news all by itself. But it doesn't stop there. Not only does he pay the price for all of our sins, but we also receive his perfection. When God looks at us, he sees his son. His son always got it right. His son didn't hide anything. His son always spoke the truth in love. His son laid down his life. His son always got it right. And when Jesus did that for us, ever since that day when we accept Jesus, God sees us through the lens of his son. And that's the grace of God. That's what we discover when we begin to answer the questions of God. He accepts us not because we are perfect, but because his son was perfect. He took our sin and we took his perfection. It's a pretty good deal. We don't just learn about the grace of God. We also learn about the insight of God. When you answer his questions, you learn about the insights of God. Now, the truth is, is that we all have some mental ruts. There's some things that we tend to think about, and there's ways that we tend to think about those things. And we all have opinions, and we all have a history in our life in which we have experienced certain things, and we believe we have learned lessons from that experience. By the way, you do not learn from experience you learn from evaluated experience. Some of us have just gone through life and had experiences. We've never really learned that much from them. But we have these mental ruts. And if somebody comes and challenges one of those thoughts, if they make a statement, we don't go, oh, you could be right. We say things like, no. Let me tell you what I think about that. And we argue with them. So someone might say, oh, Rex Ryan was really a good coach, and the Bills shouldn't have let him go, and I will argue with you. <laughs> someone who shares my opinion. We gain insights through questions. It's not through statements. You don't get many insights from something someone makes as a statement to you but you begin to gain insights when people ask you questions. This is why counselors always ask questions. How would you feel if you went in to see a counselor and you sat down and they said, eh, you don't need to tell me anything. I've already got you figured out. Your problem is, is uh, you think too much about yourself and you're too easily offended. You're selfish, you're stingy, you're ornery, and you're a bad communicator. So work on those things. Our time is up. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but we don't walk out and go, no, that's, that's not good. What did they do? They ask questions, so we begin to see things from a different perspective. And that's what God does. See, we assume all we need is more information. We already have more information than we can use. Our problem is not a lack of information. Our problem is a lack of insight. And insight comes through the questions that God asks. Now, when we answer the questions of God, we also access the wisdom of God. See, insight shows us what's actually going on that, w that was not obvious to us. Wisdom is insight about what to do. What action should we take? How are we supposed to respond? And this is challenging for us. Until we have a new insight, we're likely not to try a new approach. I've done this in counseling. I've, I've had people come in. You might be surprised, but not everybody's marriage is wonderful. And I've, I had a, a person come in, and they said, uh, my marriage is not going to survive. It's terrible. And I said, well, uh, and, and this is what they told me. And I have tried everything. I've tried everything. I said, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> How long have you been trying everything? The entire marriage I've been trying. Everything. I said, great. Why don't you tell me some of the things you have tried? And what I discovered is that they didn't try everything. They tried one thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I told them, I said, I really give you high marks for your persistence. But actually, there are other things you might be able to try that could be helpful. You see, we think we know what to do, but until we have a new insight, we're not going to be willing to try a new approach. Um, I, I was praying for someone that uh, is very close to me. And I was just kind of telling God what I, I thought should happen. And God gave me a new insight and surprised me. So I was asking God to give this person a break. They'd just been under so much pressure and so much stress and so little had gone right with them for so long. I said, what, can't you just give them a break? And God asked me a question. And the question was, what if I can't get them where they need to be by making life easy for them? What would you prefer I do? And I felt a part of my heart break. And it changed the way I prayed for that person. Because all I wanted was their life to be easier. Please understand, Jesus came and gave his life not just so life would be easier for us, but so that it would be better. And those two things are not always the same thing. He's come for us. So we gain his wisdom. So here's some prayer experiments I'd like you to try this week, okay? Answer the question, where are you, by telling God what's going on in your life right at this moment. You, this is a good way to start some prayer time with God. What's happening in your life right now? What's going on in your world right now? To suspend, you'll have time to ask all the requests that you have, but what's going on in your life right now? And what do you believe you are, where do you believe you are in your spiritual journey? So where are you? By the way, be honest about this. If you're struggling, say you're struggling. If you're wrestling with some doubts, say you're wrestling with some doubts. You might as well be honest because God already knows the answer. Remember, the reason God asks the questions is not for him. It's for us. So answer the questions. What do you hope for and long for? What do you hope for and long for? You know, that's a very challenging question because some of us are afraid to tell God what we long for because it's a little bit out of bounds. And God will ask you anyway. And it's in answering the question you start getting a new perspective on that. What brings joy in your life? What brings joy in your life? Well, if I had a million dollars and I lived in the house I wanted and I had all the stuff I wanted, I would be happy. Are you sure? Because I've met some people who have all that stuff and they are not happy. What brings sorrow in your life? The great 
question to answer. What brings sorrow in your life? What makes you feel guilt and shame? What makes you feel guilt and shame? What makes you afraid? Oh, you might be the kind of person who says, I'm not afraid of anything. Yes, you are. We all have fears. And acknowledging them in the presence of God is how we gain new insight and understanding. Now, to do this, you don't have to do a deep dive. This does not require uh, deep counseling or uh, psychotherapy or a paid professional to be in the room with you. I'll actually tell you this will probably be one of the easiest experiments you will ever do because all you actually have to do is sit quietly and just pay attention to the thoughts that begin to come to you. Our thoughts automatically gravitate to those issues. And one of the reasons we are so busy and we keep ourselves so distracted is because we are uncomfortable with the thoughts that rise in silence. And God is asking the question, where are you? Where are you? So you don't have to, this isn't going to be hard for you. The hard part is being silent enough and letting these thoughts come up and you're going to get uncomfortable. And when you get uncomfortable, you're going to think thoughts like this. This is just stupid. I don't know why I'm doing this. This is not prayer. This is a waste of my time. And do you know why you think that? Not because nothing is happening, but because something is happening you're not comfortable with. God comes to us and he says, where are you? Now, it's very likely that your most spiritually significant and emotionally significant growth can take place this year, that, and they will flow out of the conversations that you have with God. You can still ask God for his help. You can still offer up your request, but don't be surprised if he follows up with his own questions of you, and that can make all the difference this year in your life. Let's bow our heads this morning. I'm going to ask that you actually take those prayer experiments and spend some time daily. You don't have to do every one every day. But take one a day. And just sit quietly in the presence of God somewhere where you're not going to be distracted. Turn your cell phone to silent. Get away from the TV. Find a quiet place. And listen to God ask, where are you? And have the courage for an honest answer. Because it is in those honest answers you find the grace of God. You find the insight of God. And you find the wisdom of God. He has not come to hunt us down. He has not come to hurt us. He has come to rescue us. He has come to save us. And he starts with a question. So, Father, I would ask that every single one of us in this room today would find the courage to be able to listen to your questions. And rather than hide or justify or find excuses, just to be able to answer those questions honestly before you and watch what you do in and through our lives as a result of that conversation. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning.